Hello, hello, everybody. It is 9.49 a.m. Central Time on the 7th of November, 2020. It's Saturday here in the United States. It's been about a week since I've actually recorded an update to go put over on YouTube, and it's been a few days since saying hi to everybody on Twitch. Just laying low, guys. And you know what? My intro, I probably should change it to say weekly updates, right? <laughs> At least right now. Oh, man. So, hope you're doing well. We're here, of course, again, to talk about seismic events. And it's been about a week since my last full update where I issued warnings to watch for 7 to 10 days based on those deep earthquakes and the activity we were looking to spread across the Pacific. And a few of the locations were hit, a few were missed, and yesterday we saw an increase in the amount of 6.0 range activity. So that being said, I just turned on a display capture so you can see what I see just a little bit better. We'll start here where our deep earthquakes have been hammering in on the underside of the plate. We have letter Ds there to signify where we're looking for deep earthquakes to strike. And we have a deep 4.5, for instance, right in the middle of the letter D raised high off the globe. Then we go over here to the other letter Ds over in Indonesia. And, well, we have another deep earthquake right on it, right next to it. And it's a deep 4.4, so a deep 4.5 and a deep 4.4. But the distance apart is about two widths of the United States, or at least one, one and a half, thousands of miles across. Now, in the middle point between the two sets of deep earthquakes, we have an outbreak or a cluster here in eastern Papua New Guinea going right into the Solomon Islands, Solomon Sea. And that middle point is what we call a fulcrum point. A middle point between two areas. Think of a two-arm scale that starts to balance. And that middle point where all the weight accumulates and balances out. Well, that's the fulcrum point of a scale. And we're basically talking about the same thing here. But the fulcrum is on the plate boundary. Instead of it being a teetering two-arm scale perfectly balanced, it's very uneven and naturally shaped by Mother Nature. But the middle point still sorts itself out between the two areas. Or, in some cases, three, four, five areas that are in flux are moving. Now spreading out from that location, we have equidistant spaced earthquakes that are about the same size going across the planet. Again, the planet, it's not just from this one location right around it. It goes out in all directions. So let me just give you an example. Up here to the north on the Izu Ridge going up into Japan, we have a 5.8 to 6.0 earthquake that struck last night. Now at the same time, around the same time, within 12 hours of each other. All the way down here, we had a 6.0 earthquake, 5.8 to 6.0. Now, what do the two have in common? Well, they're both on the Pacific plate, of course. One's on one perimeter all the way up to the west-northwest up next to Japan, and the other's on the other perimeter all the way down to the east-southeast, all the way down next to Antarctica. And let me show it to you on the USGS plate boundary map. It might make a little bit more sense. So up here on the Izu Ridge, and all the way down here. And this is technically the Antarctic plate, and this is the Pacific plate. Now there's a transfer that occurs when there's a teetering back and forth, just like I talked about here at Papua New Guinea, that fulcrum point principle, that the plate itself does the same thing and adjusts with the other plates nearby it on a vast scale. And there's a spread going out from the middle point here out to Japan and all the way down to Antarctica. And it's the same size. It's 6.0 range activity spreading out across, well, half the planet from one side to the other. Now that just happened yesterday and there's a trajectory of earthquakes that connects between the two. And that's, for instance, like these out here on the fracture zones that connect across the Pacific Plate. If you go look at the USGS map, it just has nothing on it going across the Pacific Plate. But if we come over and check the NOAA map and the undersea topography or bathometric measurements underwater, and the fracture zones that go across these areas connect back across west to east, back over to where our big pushes are coming up underneath the plate. So let me just recap it for everybody. Deep earthquakes are hammering in on the underside of the plate, spreading out and away from where the deep earthquakes are. We have the same sized earthquakes. Again, 5.8 to 6.0 all the way up at Japan. 6.0, 5.8, all the way down next to Antarctica, and look what's right in the middle. A 5.9 to 6.0. So it's 6 in the middle, 
six up northwest six down southeast that middle point is under stress and then the middle points between the middle points come under stress hence the earthquakes in between our sets of quakes so it's a vast sorting that's going on here and it's all the same size and this is just 48 hours worth of earthquakes that we're looking at let's carry on further over to the west we have a spread of fives so we go from sixes and then we go five 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 all the way across over into Europe we'll get into Europe in a second but same thing up to the north we have a five up in Philippines and then we go further to the north and we have a 4.9 and a 4.8 if you add them together it equals five and then off the coast of Japan we have 5.2 and a 5.5 add them together it equals 5.6 to 5.7 in other words it's the same size it's the same size going out over into Indonesia five and it's the same size going up into Philippines five it spreads up into Taiwan 4.9 to 5 and it cumulative cumulative total that is goes up off the coast of Japan with a 5.5 taking all those fives and put them together now that goes across on the plate boundary again the red lines here that go all the way up into Alaska and guess which way the energy flowed all the way up into Alaska where we got another set of fives and the most recent set of earthquakes right here right on Anchorage so let me show you a five hit right here on the outskirts of Anchorage when did it hit well it hit today but what time 1223 UTC or wait is that 1223 so three hours ago we got a five right here at Anchorage I'm sure people felt that let's go back and look at the felt report see what's going on 1860 people felt this earthquake up in Alaska well people up in Alaska would you be interested to know that all the people back across the West Pacific felt the same sized earthquake if they were near land and that that same sized activity goes all the way back down and around to over here and so really we have a spread going all the way up into Alaska but there'll be many people who also remember two and a half three weeks ago right here on the peninsula of Alaska 7.5 earthquake struck with tsunami but wait let's go back over to the USGS map look at the plate black boundary here and this is where the 7.5 earthquake struck well going up into the plate that's where Anchorage is and we have marked faults up into Alaska what's the name of this fault let me see if I can get a name on it Denali fault the West Muldrow Alsec section but really when I zoom in here you'll see there's another fault what's this one called Castle Mountain the Castle Mountain fault zone don't recall ever hearing it before but that's where the earthquake is now it's a fold on the edge of the deformed portion of the accretionary belt of the coastal plain of the Great Don. In other words, just the edge that goes out into the ocean. So in the edge of the plate that spreads out to the ocean, which connects into the red line here, the thick red line, which is the plate boundary that connects back to the west over to Japan, where we have all the same sized earthquakes coming your way up into Alaska. So this is expected, by the way. We expect the flow to come out of the peninsula where you had your 7.5 and to go over here into Canada and down into the United States overall. Now, a couple days ago when I did my update, we talked about up here in Newfoundland. Newfoundland had a rare earthquake and it's about 800 miles north of where the biggest earthquake on the East Coast in recorded history took place causing a tsunami and so forth back in 1929 oh hold on one second guys I apologize about that guys let me get a sip of my coffee some people tell me not to refer to the audience as guys hey man this is the United States you get a little joke I just made hey man uh, uh, all right anyway so up here <laughs> come on man I'm always thinking so up here in Alaska that's where the flow came in now onto the edge of the Craton going down into the United States going over to the East Coast Newfoundland well that was hit at the start of this week but let's go again and go down onto the West Coast of the United States where we can trace another line of earthquakes going down across the southern United States down through Texas back up to Oklahoma to Missouri and Illinois Illinois guys Illinois 
up there in Illinois. Ah, uh, it's going to drive him crazy. I'm from Missouri, guys. Come on. So over here to the east, over at the Virginia-North Carolina border region, we're still swarming out at Sparta, which is a power line. There's a huge series of power lines right there at Sparta, where there's an outbreak of earthquakes. Now, we've traced this back, and we found that there's oil pumping operations and power lines at most of the locations across the whole plate, across the craton that are having these earthquakes. It's not just random spots. However, it seems to be randomly located along the power lines in a standing wave. But uh, that gets a little technical. Let's just go look up this earthquake over here in Illinois to go see what's there. Again, I've got to go check on my map. I did not look this up earlier. First time I've looked it up. But I, I did do some research on the town of Pesotum yesterday when or this morning or whatever when this earthquake hit and it was a pretty interesting history this refers to the uh, Indian tribe that was part of the Black Hawk Nation in Illinois back in the 1800s and the Pesotum tribe massacred the fort there and they, they, they basically they killed everybody and the town is named after them and it's a, t a tiny little town named after the Pesotum tribe, which pulled off like the biggest massacre against U.S. forces ever. And they named the town after him. I, I, again, I, I don't know why. <laughs> okay, probably some other history too. But So here's the earthquake epicenter. And we're right south of Champaign. Now look what we have here from what? When was this? November 6th. A hot spot appeared here in Illinois less than a county and a half away next to Danville, Paris. So just zooming in on the hotspot here, I didn't find anything of any significance here nearby when I zoomed in, except for power lines. The power lines going through the area. And it's pretty interesting because it's not everywhere that has these large high voltage transmission lines. We, of course, all have power lines going to our house, but that's a little different than the high voltage kind. And so, for instance, this location next to Pisotum, Right down here next to it, we do have power lines that come through the area just south of the county line. I couldn't find anything else here nearby. But I do know that just over next to the border, we have oil and gas pumping operations to the south. I don't know of any as far north as this. I would have to go inspect the area intensely to go find any kind of oil pumping operation. Let me show you what they look like. And, and by the way, again, we've got the road and we've got the power lines right next to each other with the train tracks. So the train tracks are right here too. That's something else my buddy Tattoo told me to look out for. He started identifying these hot spots and he was finding that a lot of them were coming in next to train tracks, some old train tracks that weren't even being used, like out of commission train tracks that have grass growing on them and stuff. And that's a little odd with the hot spots that that could be radio frequency induced. But let me just show you what the pumping operations here in Illinois look like so we can just if you're going to go look yourself, you can find them. That's what they look like. So they're so hard to spot. It's not like in Oklahoma where we've got... And here's some... They, some of them are just set out in the fields with their pump and their tank and their jack and their pipeline. Again, it's not like Oklahoma where you're just going to go over at a pretty good altitude and be able to identify them from the gravel pads. Uh, these are pretty sneakily done out here into the backwoods. And I'll just show you how many there are that I was able to find on my own. Again, this was just looking on my own. So the tanks, the pumps, the jacks, the pipeline. And there, there's three right here. There's another one right here. This is the actual shadow of the jack of the pump. And it just goes down the road to more. And you can see the flare-off apparatus. Hopefully you can see that. Okay, anyway, uh, this is Illinois now, right? So you don't you don't normally associate Illinois and Indiana with a lot of drilling and pumping, but we're just a couple counties to the north. I just wonder if there are any. There might not be, but when you go around the town, that's what you have to look for. You have to get in that close to go inspect and see if there's any oil wells or pumping operations out here. And again, that's from state regulations because in Oklahoma, they've made it so they can fly over easily and identify the pumping operations to inspect them to see if they're functional or not. So I would have to look in on something like this even. Which, whoa, pipeline. 
where there's pipeline there's pumping operations guys or it's coming from one or going to one okay that kind of furthers deepens the mystery here now I do want to go inspect because if we've got pumps and pipe okay now when you guys come in and look don't mistake the farmers grain bins for fracking operations you got to come in real close and look if you're gonna look you got to identify the pipelines and the jacks okay all right I could spend all day doing this I'm, I'm intrigued by it I, I like looking these things up so sorry I get a little get a little excited so let's go down to the south and check this one out look at this an earthquake right next to my house pretty interesting it's not like we get a lot of earthquake activity right around me let's go see what's going on Olympian Village Missouri seven kilometers south southwest what's our depth 9.4 kilometers well let's see how far this is from my house folks and this earthquake struck last night right I think that's what it says zooming in on Missouri and yeah that that struck yesterday last night four hours before midnight international time here's the earthquake location in regards to the Craton edge and let me show you where we are okay Olympian village a little story on this see the town hematite I guess where it gets its name <laughs> okay French village Bloomsdale Bon Terre the mines down here we have mines but they don't go down nine kilometers down into the crust and then let me show you where I'm at just so okay now I've already been doxxed everybody already knows where I'm at I'm right here okay just north of what actually I'm right there so I mean I can measure let's see how far we are from my location let's measure in miles since we're here in the US guys roughly speaking 40 miles 47 miles from my house now look what's there hot spots when did the hot spots appear there's two detections on November 6th and across the river over in Illinois on November 6th and down here on the New Madrid seismic zone next to Perryville and that's again on the same date so the Bon Terre mines down here and they did lead mining see this is called the Vals mines let's zoom in and see these houses or anything else here nearby I don't see anything else here of any significance nearby I can certainly tell you 100% without a shadow of a doubt Missouri has no pumping operations at these locations so no oil no fracking in Missouri wait hold on wait look where we, look what's right here look what's right here look at that three sets no that's not that's a road but there's three sets of power lines on it is that right three sets of power line do we have a street level hold on one two we at least have two so two sets of three that come in one two here and the third over these are big let me see if I got a street level on it dang no street level but then again you go driving around out here in the Google car you might not come back all right yeah look at that they have no <laughs> no drive across underneath the power lines we have to go all the way up here to get a view on them let's do that oh wait look like there was one right here hold on yeah there's one right here so we have to go about 10 miles north to get a view on the power lines they just were refusing to drive underneath them look at that yep okay so we got earthquake right next to a series of transmission lines high voltage no doubt about it you would have to try to tell me that these high voltage power lines are everywhere and they're not they're just like one or two spots per county for instance you can see it coming through this county right here where we just came through you can see there's not many other large clear cuts across the rest of the entire county that might be the only one well no there's one up here so the chance of getting the earthquake right at the spot where the lines come through you could say it was chance if it was just a few times but I went through for instance all the earthquakes in the United States last week in my video and I have video proof so it's saved on my YouTube channel 
And even in the middle of nowhere, and I'm talking out in the middle of the Mojave Desert, where there's no power lines except for three spots across the entire Mojave, and right next to the power lines, multiple earthquakes, earthquake swarm broke out. I think it's either coming up out of the crust, going up into the power lines, causing the earthquake, or power coming down for some reason, either out of the lines or out of space or both. And the sun, of course, would be the cause of that out of space, but that it would come down and go down through the power lines into the ground and that would have an increase or piezoelectric discharge into the crust or up out of the crust. That's what I think is going on. I do. I, I mean, come on. It's a rare earthquake next to the mines, which don't go down that deep. But guess what does go down into the ground there? Lots of shafts that are lined with metal and, well, in probably some cases, even pipes, but not for gas or oil. It's so interesting, isn't it, to have that there? Now, let's go look at 24 hours worth of earthquakes on the West Coast and the rest of the United States. We have to look at one day's worth of earthquakes. We can look at two days, but one day really gives us a good idea of what's moved in the last day, obviously. And we need to see what's moved in the last day so we can see what's getting ready to move in the next few. So one area shifts, and then the next area moves. Okay? So looking across the Craton one more time, the earthquake since last night, going down through Texas, back up to Oklahoma, over to Missouri, again, 47 miles from my house at a series of high voltage transmission lines. And there's like three or four sets of them there, which again, now again, I got to stress this, that there's not that many. So to have three or four sets of them right there is just a slam dunk. Let's go down to Texas. Let's go look up the 3.3 that struck on the edge of the Craton down in Texas. I'm not going to even try and pronounce that. What is that? Koyanosa? I could put a Texas on it, but that's probably not going to work either. It'll be cringe too, so let's just skip that. Let's go down to Texas and go see what's going on and get a sip of my coffee along the way. Oh, wait. Well, look, looky here, y'all. <laughs> hey, y'all, looky here. And look what we got going through the desert here. We've got a series of high voltage transmission lines. Two sets of them. They intercross and intersect each other here. Look at them all. There's like a stand of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 smaller ones and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 big ones. Oh, wait, hold on. Look what else we have here. We have a team of people with a derrick. And the derrick is doing drilling and all these things that are laid out on the side of this derrick, which, again, you got to look at this three-dimensionally. This thing's standing straight up and down. But from flying over, of course, it's going to be at an angle. And you see all this? That's the pipeline. And they even have more over here. Now, again, actually, hold on. This, These might be the drill bits. This might be the pipeline. Or these might be the drill bits. And this might be the pipeline. I don't know which. But I know they connect each one of these, whether they're pipelines or whether they're drill bits, and they connect them and drill down and over and at an angle. So they will come down, over, either way, north, south, east, west, whatever, and go down at an angle. And that's fracking. We're doing fracking and oil gas extraction. But in this case, we're at the intersection of fracking along with a boatload of power lines. Now, I wonder if I can get this on street level. I just wonder. I mean, I, we might not be able to. Ooh. Ooh. Okay, we get one somewhat close. Let's see if I can get it to the closest juncture, if we can look down the power lines right here and see what the deal is. Oh, wait. There's an electric... Huh, to top it all off, look. There's an electrical substation right here. Big time. Look at that. That's huge. Why do they blur that out? Why blur that out? That's weird. Why blur out that? What's going on? Hold on. Blur out the entrance? That's weird. Okay. So, looking in all directions, you see these aren't just your regular power lines to your house. And you see we have a substation here that's pretty impressive in its own right. And that's where they're going to have transformers and they'll reamplify the signal to put it back out and down further down the wires, from what I understand. I'm not an electrician, but 
I think that's how it works. So the substations, I think, reamplify or transform the signal. Whatever. The, the electric. Anyway, you don't get those everywhere. Those aren't exactly everywhere. I mean, they are all over the place, but they're not everywhere. So to get an earthquake next to it, along with the drill points. I've already said this several times now. I think that the drill points, well, I don't think. I know that the drill points have metal casements that go down. They're not using clay pipe, okay? So the metal piping that's going down into the ground is going down kilometers. It's like an antenna in the ground. Or, or some kind of grounding apparatus that you would put on a house, but way, way bigger and deeper. So is that going to allow for electricity to ground down into the crust? Or is that going to allow for electricity to come up through the crust out of the ground? Which way is it? It could be both, too. I mean, if it's alternating current, it could be, it, or, or DC. But I, I think it could be that it could be doing a back and forth between the electrical lines and the drill points and the shatter points in the crust. So, getting back to it. I just proved it. We're at an intersection of huge power lines and drill points. I just proved it up here in Missouri. We're right again, right next to the high transmission, high voltage power lines. We'll go over here on the East Coast. I already talked about that in my last update. Sparta, it's right there. I mean, it's right there. The New York earthquake from last week, right there. And I mean, it was right below the power lines. It wasn't, you know, 100 feet to the west or east or anything. It was directly below the clear cuts of the power lines. And there's a tower right above it. So what could cause it? Piezoelectric, guys. Think of scuffing your feet across the carpet and going and shocking yourself on a door handle. How does that happen? You scuff your feet across the carpet and the electrons build up and get taken up through your feet on whatever shoes or socks or whatever you're wearing. And if it's dry enough, of course, you collect more electrons and they go up into your body and they store it like a battery or a capacitor is more like what it stores at because it all shoots out at once once you touch something. The entire charge. So it's like a battery that discharges all at once. A capacitor. And that's what you're doing when you're pulling up these electrons off the carpet as you scuff your feet. But now what happens when the plate scuffs across the magma down below or the magma scuffs across the bottom of the plate? What happens when the plate starts to shift and move and build? What happens when you dump a bunch of electric charge down into the crust from the power lines? Or what happens when the power lines suck up a bunch of power out of the crust? Or what happens when Mother Nature has a solar event that comes down and bombards the power lines and the crust and the drill points all at once with a great amount of electric charge? What do you think could happen? All kinds of stuff, I think. I don't think it's all going to be inert and go away and not have any effect. That's the old school 1900s thought. The old, outmoded, outdated, nothing has an effect on each other thought. We don't do that here. That's for children. And university professors. Which are just big babies. So. <laughs> Come on. If you're a university professor. You need to learn how to take a little beating online. Alright. All right. Come, welcome to the club. To the Dutch Sense Club. You got to learn how to take a beating before you can keep going. And trust me. I, 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 even my trolls will agree with this one. Man have we got a beating over the years. Let's go on and carry on. So let's go up into the West Northwest. Let's go up here to a place called Mount Rainier. Wait, it doesn't say that on the USGS site, though. It says, 22 kilometers east-northeast of Ashford, Washington, which is a polite way of saying we're right below a volcano. So let's go look it up. That's the USGS's way of saying, hey, we're right at a volcano. <laughs> we're right below the crater of Mount Rainier. 22 kilometers east-northeast of... There we are, and we are on the flank south side of the crater itself. Now, don't worry, it's not going to erupt. At least, I don't think so. It's a sign of the plate shifting still. And I say the plate shifting still because the plate is still shifting. Let's go look it up and go see, or at least it was as of the last couple days. Going over to the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network. Let's go over there and see it. See what's going on. As of yesterday, we have 712 tremors centered in two pockets, one in Northern California the other at the Washington-Canada border region, right across the Olympic Peninsula, going up into Victoria. And the two clusters total 712 individual recorded tremors, and each one has a magnitude assigned to it. But I don't want you to think of these like earthquakes. You need to think of them like vibrations. And some of them are bigger. 
So we do have ones, upper ones to near 2.0 magnitude associated with these vibrations, but there's no breaking in the plate. So again, I don't want you to think of these like earthquakes. That's not like a break in a fault. Think of this more like, <laughs> hold on. <laughs> Put on your headphones, ASMR people. I'm going to do a sound effect for you. Think of it like this. <laughs> Think of it like that as opposed to crack and break. Okay, that's perfect. That's, oh man, that, that's priceless Dutch sense right there. Wait, did I refer to myself in the third person? Okay, we're done. I'm out of here. <laughs> so we have 700 little small vibrations here across Northern California going up into Washington. That's yesterday. Let's go back a day. Let's go back to the fifth. Well, wow. There's 875. There's more. So there's actually less yesterday than the day before, but there's still just hundreds and hundreds going on. Again, Northern California, and again, Washington. So I'm going to take you back in time. Let's go back in time. 88 miles an hour. There we go. We're, now we are back at the 24th. And where are we again? Well, this time we're in Oregon with just a little bit going on down in California. And most of the activity at the Washington-Oregon border region, the cluster. And it is 100 of them. So wait. That's the 24th, right? So let's go forward back to today. Well, the 6th. Look where we shifted. We spread out in two directions. From the center, where we were here. And we went up to the north and down to the south. Well, up to the north and down to the south correspond with something. Let me show you on the USGS map here from the plate boundary. Up to the north, right here at the Strait of Juan de Fuca and the Olympic Peninsula. And down to the south. Northern California. Do you see anything out here in the ocean? That's the Juan de Fuca Fracture Zone, and it points in like a giant arrow to the spot that's shifting here to the north, and it points in like a giant arrow to the spot that's shifting down here to the south. Both arms of the Juan de Fuca are shifting to the north and to the south. Why does that matter? Because I just showed it to you that it was moving in the center, and I can even prove that further. We can Let's go back to like the 20th. See if it shows it there. There. See that? It's centered mostly in Washington, which is to spread out a little bit down into Oregon. We can even go back a few more days, go back to like the 17th. Now we're solely in Washington and Vancouver Island. We were centered in Washington. Now we spread out. We spread out to the north, up to the Canada border, and we spread out down to the south. And both of those points correspond with the Juan de Fuca fracture zone out in the ocean where the tension is being created and it's then coming in over to the east and going along the coast of the United States, which really just goes into the edge of the craton. And then over to the east. Hence, we've had earthquakes spread all the way across the plate. And then the weird points start to get hit, like the drill points, like the power lines, like the drill points, power lines, mines, weak points in the crust over across the plate, over to the east, again, over across the edge of the craton. On the west coast, it's slightly different, but we still see the power lines getting hit. But you have to add in the volcanic locations. So there's one more piece of the puzzle, if you will, over on the west coast, aside from the power lines and drill points, which on their own are just enough to, you know, really increase the seismic activity in each area. The volcanic activity, or the volcanic locations, are already weak points by Mother Nature, where Mother Nature is punched up through the crust. There's already old lava tubes and vents that come up through the crust, and they're either sealed off or capped off or tufted off on top by magma, but nonetheless, there's still fracture points in the crust. And going across the craton, we have a little line of earthquakes coming out of Montana, going down into Yellowstone Park. Now, I would like to look these up because last week, I went and looked a lot of these up, and for some reason, they were all explosions. Quarry Blast and the like. But this time, they're not. So it's just weird that last week, it was just nothing but Quarry Blast after Quarry Blast after Quarry Blast in a line. It was almost like it was almost like somebody was doing some experiments from the USGS to test and see whether or not there were any transfers or any increase or decrease in power in areas across the edge of the craton. It's almost like somebody's out there testing it right now or something. I don't know. I could be wrong. 
I've been wrong before. So look where we are. We're at a location that had a 5.8 earthquake back on July 6th of 2017. You guys remember this? Three years ago, a near 6.0 earthquake struck up here right in Montana. You guys know about that, but I'm going in to look at the location. Let's go see if there's anything else here nearby. Okay, well, again, we're along a road. Is there anything else of any significance? I don't see any mines in the area, Mark. No quarries, nothing to blast. It's edge of the Great Don. Now, really, we're just north of Yellowstone. So here is Yellowstone National Park. And the edge of the Craton is going right through the middle of the park. That's not a coincidence, by the way. The edge of the Craton is a weak point where magma can come up through on the seam between the deformed edge and the more stable portion. It turns out all of our supervolcanoes, or at least every one that I've looked up so far, not just in the United States but around the world, that they're happening at the boundaries between the Craton edges. So look out in California, where the purple meets the green right along the California-Nevada border. That's where Long Valley Caldera is, the other supervolcano on the west coast. So Yellowstone is formed on the boundary between the Craton, the stable portion, and the deformed portion, between the brown, or the tannish color, whatever color you want to call that, and the purple. But another supervolcano is formed at the other edge of the other edge of the Craton over on the west coast at the California-Nevada border. Can't be chance or coincidence on that. Maybe if you're a professional, you might want to look into that. Hey, you could get your whole thesis written. Get your PhD. You know what that stands for. A person who heard Dutch since. <laughs> all right. All right. Let's go down to South. California, Nevada border. Uh-oh. An explosion. We got an explosion out here. Let's go look at the quarry. Now, I don't know if it's going to be too wise. To be out there blowing stuff up right now in Oregon. It just doesn't seem wise right now. For many reasons. Oh wait, did I say Oregon? It's triangulated from Oregon. It's Washington. Explosion. Wait. Why wouldn't they list this as a quarry blast? That's the most odd thing in the world. Because down in California, well, I could show you. We have a quarry blast that get listed out here all the time. But I don't want to waste your time on showing you something small. It's just an explosion. Okay, no biggie. Let's go down to the south. Government Camp, Oregon. But this one's at a 1.4 kilometer depth. So this one's not an explosion up at the surface. By the way, that explosion at the surface, not listed as a quarry blast, technically wasn't at the quarry. Either that or the coordinates are wrong. I wonder if the coordinates are wrong on this. Because look where we are. We're right at Mount Hood Volcano. And this is just like Mount Rainier, the one that I showed you up here. The earthquake coming in at Mount Rainier right below the crater. You'd think the USGS would tell you, right? But like, like it said, it was 22 kilometers east, southeast of such and such Oregon. They don't tell you if it's at a volcano, but in this one, they don't tell you either. And I would be very interested if I was a seismologist or a volcanologist to know that these earthquakes are striking at these volcanoes before there's any kind of activity that takes place. And that we can see the increase that takes place at these volcanoes before we see an increase spread to other locations. Now, look over to the east. Over to the east at Idaho, our biggest earthquake to strike in the last week just took place last night. Stanley, Idaho. A four has struck on the edge of the gray time. Now, hold on. Why didn't you hear about that on the news? Why aren't they talking about fours or greater that are striking across the plate that get felt reports across the country? Well, you know what? Out of sight, out of mind. But this location in Idaho had big fires that broke out at it just a few weeks back. Last month, major fires all the way across here. And I looked up the earthquake epicenter and what I found, <laughs> something a little interesting over here to the east, we have these high tension power lines, these high voltage power lines that are going into a giant open pit mine. But the earthquakes are happening many kilometers down below in the crust. So there's something else here. Guess what's here? Well, we do have more high voltage power lines. Pretty interesting that they would be there. But this is above the magma chamber for Yellowstone. See central Idaho here? Here's Yellowstone National Park at the surface where the magma chamber comes up to the surface. 
but going down below all of Idaho over to the west. Well, that goes right across the central portion of Idaho over to Oregon. That's the magma chamber for Yellowstone. It's 11 Grand Canyons in size, measured with Earth-penetrating tomography, so there's no debating that. It's that big, and it goes down at an angle, 30 kilometers or more, down below Idaho. Well, this is the central portion of the magma chamber. Just, it goes down at an angle, and of course it goes below Oregon. Again, it's the center, but it goes up above it where the earthquakes are, where the magma chamber is down below this. Now, what could cause a four at the magma chamber for Yellowstone? Small earthquakes over at Mount Rainier, down at Mount Hood, cause power line earthquakes to develop across the rest of the craton as static energy, or whatever you want to call it, piezoelectric energy, building up inside of something as it's shifting or moving, but itself not moving, the, the substance next to it, the magma may be down below. There's many caught. It could even be heat. You know, heat is nothing more than moving electrons, right? Hey, there's room for invention in there, by the way. I got an invention for everybody. You ready? I'm going to give you an invention. You can make a trillion dollars, on, well, literally a trillion dollars on this, maybe even more. I'll give it to the world right now. You ready? A brick made of aluminum plates on the outside, and then right below the aluminum plates, copper, just a little sheet, could be a millimeter thick, doesn't even matter the thickness on this, aluminum sheet on the outside, copper sheet on the inside, and carbon, carbon black, like you would use in a printer toner ink, maybe, on the inside of that, a big old brick of it. And you place the bricks around your fireplace. And fire up the fire. Go burn some wood in there. And hook up a wire into the brick, into the carbon. Could be a copper wire. You could even have another wire of carbon. But just stick a wire into the center of that brick on the back side so it doesn't melt. And you're going to be able to convert that heat into electricity. It'll work in the sun, too. And it'll work underwater. And at night. Or in the snow. Or in space. Have a nice day. I'm out of here. Peace out. <laughs> My contribution to humanity. You can thank me later. All right. Oh, yeah. A way to convert heat into electricity. There you go. <clears throat> so, yeah. Why, why bother with a patent? I'm not going to make it, man. Yeah, it, people tell me to patent that. No, you go patent it. Make it and patent it. You become a billionaire. You'll change the world. Okay. Down to the south we go. Let's go into the northern valley of California. Let's go pull this 2.6, see where it is. Red Bluff, California. And it's listed as a 2.7, not a 2.6 for some reason. Okay, well, they have it on the feed as two different magnitudes. Not that it matters, they're a point apart. A tenth of a point apart. Wait, oh man, oh, oh dude. Okay. Look where we are. An electrical substation but there's something else here well first of all it's a juncture of like three of them but this this these I should say are the inskip volcanic buttes the the hills here are actual old volcanoes that go back to the Pleistocene to the Ice Age here's the Smithsonian if you want to read it it's not much it's <laughs> inskip hill and nearby pyroclastic cones were thought to be of Holocene age but later mapping indicates Pleistocene age from Miller, 1989. We're going to hear his name a lot when you look up these volcanoes, by the way. Miller set out to reprove that the volcanoes were younger, not older. And so there they are. And look what goes right through the middle of the volcanic butte. A series of high voltage, and I'm talking big time. There's like five sets of them. Let's go right below them and see. Look how many are here. And these are the big, big kind. So it's not just, there, there's moderate, big, and big. Oh, and look what goes underneath them. There's your regular local power lines, which and in this case, they're actually kind of big. So we have two sets of intersecting power lines. You guys know what happens when you intersect energy? I'll give you a quick crash course in Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Bearden's scalar interferometry. <laughs> when you have two areas where there's colliding power... That area where the power collides, going one way and the other, since it's actually moving in many cases, in AC, alternating current, standing in place but moving, standing wave. 
that where the beams cross of energy, that's called a scalar. And they are doing what's called scalar Higgs boson experiments over at CERN, where they collide microwave beams. CERN scalar Higgs boson. Yeah, there it is, the scalar boson. This is from CERN itself, atlas.cern. Dot CERN, you know they have their own dot domain. There it is, the scalar boson. Here's a complex way to show it in a chart that nobody's gonna understand. Let me just explain it this way. One beam of energy coming one way, one beam of energy coming the other. Collide them and boom. You get an explosion at a distance in the scalar. As Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Bearden told us in 1985, that the Russians were doing to us using high power, high, tra high frequency transmission facilities from in Russia on the ground. Anyway, so here we are, we're next to a series of high voltage transmission lines at a break in the plate that Mother Nature made. Mother Nature made the break in the plate here. Humans have further exacerbated the problem by putting this high voltage power lines on either side, but right through it. So I think it's already a weak point. I, well, I don't think. We know it's already a weak point. There's a volcano there. So there's a weak point in the crust that's coming up through the plate. And what do you think about that scuffing of your feet analogy that I used earlier? That if you're going to build a charge in something and you give it a thinner way to get through, it's like wearing a glove that's thin enough to allow for the electric charge to pass through the glove at one point. So you scuff your feet across the carpet. You're wearing a set of gloves, but there's a little hole in the glove that allows for that electric to go through there as opposed to the resistance or the insulation of the rest of the glove. Pretty simple. And look, it's one of the only locations on the, well, in the county that has that. And that's just the first quake I looked up. Let's go over to the east. Mineral, California. Well, let's put the coordinates in and see what's at Mineral and you got to do this for all the earthquakes at this point, guys. It takes a while. It sure does. Oh, look at this. We're at a place called Maidu. Maidao, but I think it's called Maidu. And it's an ancient series of volcanic pyroclastic cones and a stratovolcano that erupted a long time ago. Right on the side of it. Now, I do wonder if there's anything else here nearby. We've got a lot of roads. Do we have any high-voltage power lines? I don't see any. So there are no high voltage power lines anywhere here nearby, as far as I can tell. Let's just make sure. We have to look within a certain distance. I'd say look within a couple miles. Since the piezoelectric discharge can go out and spread out, of course, miles. Yeah, so it's right next to a volcano. As far as I can see, that's the only thing of any significance there nearby. The power lines running into town are pretty small. As far as I can tell, I, they just look like regular power lines, so. Okay, that's good to know. So one spot, volcano and power line. The other spot, just volcano. And it's directly at Maidu. Both earthquakes are on both sides of the peak of the old volcano. Let's go on. See this place called the Geysers of California? Can you guess what's there? If you're new, can you guess? You can guess. But I'm asking you, can you guess what's there? I'm giving you permission to guess. Not that you need it. But, of course, there's geysers there. That's why it's called geysers. But look what they have. Electrical generating stations that are turned by steam from the volcano that's here. This is Clear Lake Volcanic Field. And on the side of Clear Lake Volcanic Field, they've got all of these. Turbines. And the turbines are putting out power. Look at the power lines coming out of the turbines. Do we have a street level here? Wow, no street level here in California. You think they would have a street level, huh? Well, there it is. And this all burned last year. This all caught on fire and burned to the ground last year. And that's where the earthquake swarm is. So let's recap one more time for all the people. A line of earthquakes coming out of Montana, going down into Yellowstone at the park. Then, at the deepest part, or the center of the deepest part of the magma chamber, we have a swarm going up to 4.0 directly above it in Idaho. Up to the west-northwest, Mount Rainier has a quake below it. Then we have an explosion. Then, down here at Mount Hood, we have an earthquake. 
So two volcanoes getting hit. Then to top it all off, we are shaking, shimming, and vibrating as the plate is shifting across Washington and Northern California. Northern California is shaking, shimming, and vibrating with the Juan de Fuca, and right next to it, power line earthquake. What do you want to bet? Static discharge into the cross from the plate shifting. Going over to Maidao. Going down to Geysers. All power generation stations at Geysers. So power generation and high voltage power lines there. Power transmission there. Volcano there. What about the 2.1? It's the only one I haven't looked up yet. Willits, California. And you know what? To see this one, let's go turn on the San Andreas Fault markings here. Well, actually, not the San Andreas. The Hayward Fault going up to the north. Or is that Napa Valley? Well, you know what? I can find out. I can actually get the name on the earthquake. Fault zone map here. Makama Fault Zone, north section at the Makama Fault, which goes down to something called the south section of the Makama Fault. Pretty interesting. <laughs> then the Hellsberg Fault, which goes then down into the Bay Area, and that then connects into the Hayward Fault. All right, so we got a bunch of names that we're never going to remember. What else is there? Let's get the coordinates. Put the coordinates in and go C. Willits. You know, I think I've got some viewers up here at Willits. Somebody wrote me from Willits several years ago when I was doing the unboxings. Got a postcard or something. It was just like a little letter. Willits, California. They said, you know what? We got to come up here. I think I was making jokes about Northern California. I'm pretty sure. Because <laughs> you guys remember what I found when I looked. I okay, you can imagine what I found. I was zooming in on Northern California. There's an earthquake. And I'm up here in a place called Humboldt County, wherever that is. And I'm zooming in and I see these greenhouses out in the middle of the woods. And I'm like, what are those? And I zoom in and more. <laughs> Californians, man. I think I found a little bit of green or shrubbery. Shrubbery growing out there in the middle of the woods. You know what I mean? All right. Where are we? We've got a series of houses here. Now, the voltage, high voltage power lines coming into town are pretty far away. So I would say, okay, that's far enough. Or, or are they? Ah, well, they're within a few miles. But no, wait, wait. They aren't, look, I would call these just regular. I would call those just regular power lines. Maybe when we get down here, you might get into bigger, you know, the bigger towers. Yeah, they are. They are. They take a step down. Look, they're at the bigger towers there. And then by the time they get up here, it looks like it branches off. And by the time you get up here, it's smaller power lines. Okay. Okay, that's good. That's good. I, I don't want to see power lines at every location. I'm just looking to see if they're there. Something I started to keep track of in the past couple weeks. And man, am I freaked out to find out how many are there. What do we got going on here? Oh, no way. No way. <laughs> oh, man. How many times have I had to get up and walk away from this broadcast today? Dude. All right. Well, you know. Roll another one. Just like the other one. And pass it over to me. Come on, come on, hippies. Put on your Birkenstocks. Get on your hemp necklaces. Weave me a dream catcher and catch me a dream. Let's get out of here. Let's ski daddle on out of there. Oh my God, what an update. Okay, let's carry on. Pinnacles, California. I'm face palming. Okay. That's a face palm sound. Okay. Kids, don't do that stuff. It's bad for you. There we are. Okay, here's our earthquake epicenter, and we're right here along the famous San Andreas Fault. And you can see the San Andreas. It's marked here in the mountains. It's a diagonal line going northwest to southeast. It literally is breaking through the mountains. Now look at that. What do we have here? Looks to me like temporarily filtered fire pixels. Wait, did we have a big fire here? Is this where the fire happened? Maybe. No? No. No, it's not. And I know they're not going to be doing any burning out here of any kind of, you know, frivolous burning. Wow, we're right next to an unnamed mine. Let's go and see what the mine is. Oh, yeah. Yeah, unnamed mine. Wonderful. 
Okay, well, we've got hot spots, an unnamed mine, and we're on the San Andreas. There couldn't be anything else here nearby of any significance, could there? How about right over here over to the east, starting right here, we have a bunch of pumping operations. And I mean a bunch. Going down to the south, oh, actually, I shouldn't exaggerate. Down here, we have a bunch. Right here, we have a few. So there's like maybe four or five just in this field. One, two, look, there's the tanks, the pumps, the jacks, the flare apparatus in case there's any kind of overpressure or emergency. There's another set. And then we can get the actual shadows of the jacks of the pumps right there. Should be able to see that. Okay, anyway, we're right next to it, right next to where the drill points start. And you see this branches off right down to where the drill points begin. And we can go over to the USGS map and it'll even, I think, show it there. Let's go see. Does it show branching off? Yeah. Yeah. Branching off right down in here. You see how it branches over? What's the name of that? Oh, we don't have the name on it. Okay, that's fine. But you see it. It branches over to the east, and that's where the earthquake is. Now, guess what? The earthquakes come down the San Andreas, like they normally should, which is this giant, thick red line here, the plate boundary. Earthquakes come down it. When it gets down to about here, jumps over into the valley. Jumps over to the drill points. So far, that hasn't happened today. Instead, there's a line of quakes coming down to the 1.9. But there's not really that many back up behind it, are there? There's an open point between up here and down here where the 1.9 is. That open point I expect to be filled in by something larger than what's on both sides. Now I've got news for everybody. The number of earthquakes here is low for the last 24 hours. Let me make sure I've got the last 24 hour feed turned on. I sure do. So we don't have any earthquake activity except for that one up at Mount Hood volcano in Oregon. Nothing. But wait, isn't the plate shifting down here in California? Again, hundreds of tremors with no earthquakes? Yeah, that's happening right now. Northern California and Washington are shifting as the Juan de Fuca fracture zone out here is compensating or pushing in and the plate starts to compensate. So the Juan de Fuca pushes in, the plate compensates with vibrating and shifting. It's pushing in out of the Juan de Fuca fracture zone and it's going to push over into Idaho, hence the new 4.0 earthquake. And down to the south, we should get about the same size going into California. We're moving a four up in Idaho. Stands to reason we should see new fours down in California. Where? At our middle points between our sets of earthquakes. So, for instance, that would put a middle point between these earthquakes up here in Northern California, the shaking and shimmying and vibrating, and the earthquakes down here at Monte Cristo Hills at the California-Nevada border. That would put the halfway point somewhere here north of Lake Tahoe. Keep watch. Could see 4.0 or greater activity very soon in the next few days. Same with the area just south of the Bay Area, which I guess is technically Diablo or Monterey Bay, California. Same with further to the south down in Southern California, but we would look between our sets of quakes down here, and that would put us right in the middle. Let's see, where is that? Ukaipa? <laughs> of all places. So if I were to lean towards an area, I would first lean towards the area to the north, since that's the area that's shifting. And so we would warn Lake Tahoe area, and we would warn just south of the Bay Area first. But we have to watch all the way down to Southern California. And the spots in Southern California, between them is where we watch, in the middle point, between our two sets of quakes, one in the L.A. Basin and one down in Southern California. So this 2.1 out in the middle of the desert, High voltage transmission lines right next to them in the middle of the desert. Mojave Desert. Nobody lives out there. Let me show you. Well, I mean, well, there's people who live in the Mojave, but let me just show you where we're going. We're literally in the middle of the desert, guys. So there we are. Eastern California going out into the high desert. Earthquake right here. Voltage lines. High voltage, big, big ones, multiple sets of them right next to it. That's where the 2.1 is. Up here to the north, we're going across from, well, here, let me show you a picture. Speaks a thousand words. Little Lake, California, going down into Ridgecrest. 
there's something here. Something that's similar to most of the other locations that I've shown you through this whole dang update. And these are all the earthquakes that have struck since yet in the last 24 hours. So nobody can tell me that it's just random chance that, look where we are. We're at a volcano again. And not just at any volcano, we're at Volcano Peak. And what's this? Hold on. Wow. A hot spot out here in the desert. Yesterday, November 6th. Hot spot out here. Well, there are some quarries, but wait. There's something else here. The Kozo Volcanic Field Geothermal Pumping Operation and Electrical Generating Substations and Stations. Or, they're not generating substations. Generating stations and transmission line substations that go out from here. They go out across the desert, follow down through the valley, and go down to power, I think, all of the secret military stuff at China Lake. Now, the hot spot over here is just too weird to have a hot spot next to another earthquake, next to the high power lines, high tension power lines, next to the volcanoes. Let's go down into LA. Monterey Park, 18 kilometer depth. What's down in Los Angeles? Well, there's people, lots of people. That's what's in LA. The Vaporwave store is in LA. Vapor 95, gotta go there, man. Gotta go there at some point. Oh, wait, whoa, wow. This is the whole power for the whole freaking city right here. I'm not joking, man. Here, hold on. Am I, is, this, is this what it looks like? Yeah, it is. Dude, look how many there are. Why do we not have a ground? Wait, it just took a minute. Let's go back in. Dang. LA's whole, like, well, you know, their, their main power for the city. Oh, look, there's a cell phone tower right there, too. Is that 5G? Oh, my goodness. Look at that. That's a masterpiece. This is, this is a masterpiece of electrical engineering. But it's also just begging for an earthquake. Just begging for it. Begging. And that's where it is. That's where the quake is. Right next to it. Right there. Hey, wait, we've got an oil pumping operation right across the street. I say, old boy. I say, old boy. Elementary, my dear Watson. Look, oil pumping operation right across the street. So we've got a puncture point that goes down into the crust where they have metal pipelines that go down into the crust a few miles. And that's, I think, acting like our VLF antenna down in the crust. Collecting energy and bringing it up or collecting energy from up and taking it down. Either way. It's causing the quake. Let's go over to the east. 1.4. Wait. See? Proof. Proof. Boop, boop, boop. Everybody, look. Proof. They can report a quarry blast as opposed to an explosion. So why didn't they have that explosion up next to that quarry a couple miles away? Listed as a quarry blast up in Washington. Huh? Hmm? Curious. Well, we're at a quarry this time. At least we're at a quarry. It's proof they can triangulate coordinates down to the right point to get it to a quarry if it's at a quarry. Wait, isn't there something else here nearby? I I, I don't know. I, I, I'm asking. Don't we have something else here right next to Corona, California? I think there is. An oil pumping operation. I don't know if it's on both sides, but it's on the west side. We also have the Nexrad radar. Do we have power generation going on at this? What if there is? Oh, man. Dude, if there's power generation going on at this, it's not like they're generating power everywhere, guys. So if we're going in next to a place where they're generating power, at a quarry, it's a weak point in the crust, piezoelectric discharge. I just wonder, is there electrical generation going on here? Maybe not. Metropolitan Water District. It might not. This might be for just for water purposes, for drinking. But you'd think they would use the flow of the water out to generate electricity. I don't see anything here nearby. I don't see any big... Like, this looks like for, for water. 
Ah, yes, you gotta look, guys. You gotta look and see if they're using it. And again, that's not, but so that's not power generation. The only thing here nearby, quarry. That's good. The next rad's right at the top of the hill. The high power microwave transmitter. Oh, it's not related, Dutch. Nothing related. It's not related. 750,000 watts of microwave energy put out into the sky is not going to come back down into the magnetic fields of the Earth. Okay. You mean that AC of the radio wave doesn't convert to DC eventually? Inefficiency scaling? Wow, I'm surprised to hear that the laws of nature are suddenly suspended in California. Redlands, California. Let's go put the coordinates in. Do you even know what I'm talking about? Radio waves. All waves. All electromagnetic waves will be absorbed ultimately by the Earth if they're in the Earth's magnetic field. Unless they're more powerful than the Earth's magnetic field. And you say, oh, well, Earth's magnetic field's really weak, Dutch. Me, me, me. And I say, yeah, right. Planetary-wide, I mean. On a planetary scale. So here's our earthquake epicenter. Is this some kind of quarry blast? It's right next to another quarry. Is it? Sure is. It's right across the street from a quarry. But it's 13 kilometers down inside of the cross. So is this at a fault? Is this at a fault going through Redlands? Wait, didn't I mention Yukaipa? Wait, what's this? No way. No way. A new hotspot. Guys, hold on. A new hotspot down here at Yukaipa. As of last night. What the heck? been months it's been months it, it, it again it's it's literally been months fire on a clear day august 2nd 2020 two months wait three months three months august september october technically almost four months you could say it's four months if you include the first month as the first month you know what i mean so it's been months and months since our big fire here why would we suddenly get another hot spot at a spot that already burned months and months ago now? You couldn't tell me it's lingering embers of a burning tree stump four months later. What else is here? Is there anything else here nearby that we just don't know about? You gotta wonder. So we got houses, we have subdivisions, but, you know, where there's people, there's always the potential of creating fire on their own, you know, with some kind of accident or deliberate arsonist or something. What is this? The power lines going around right through here. Hold on. But they're, they're not huge. These are not huge high voltage power lines. They're just the regular kind. All right. Well, I don't see anything else there. The only thing that I see there is the previous fire location. But I do know that there's something natural here right next to you, Kaipa. Let me show you on the USGS map. Down here in Southern California. That could be leading to the cause of the hotspots and the earthquakes. Well, I suppose I need to turn on the right key here. Street level view. There's banning... There's Yukaipa. And look, the thick red line. This is the San Andreas Fault. This thick red line that goes all the way back up and connects to the Juan de Fuca. It goes right down through there. I'm talking like a mile away. Maybe a couple miles. So recapping. Most of our earthquakes are happening either next to high voltage transmission lines of some kind, power generation stations of some kind, volcanoes of some kind, or, in some cases, geothermal locations, which are also being used for power generation. Going down to Southern California, all the way. The only spots that I have not fully looked up yet are down in far South California and here in Nevada. So should we go into Nevada and go take a look? Let's do it. Do it. <laughs> the Dark Emperor would say it. Come on, do it with me, guys. Do it. You can do it. That's what the Department of Defense said. By the way, I heard Mark Espers offered his resignation. Come work on YouTube, man. You'll make more money. Leave the DOD. Start your own YouTube channel. Okay. 
That's a joke, by the way. Everything just got cut back on YouTube. All right, look where we are. We are at a thing that looks like it's an old town, right? You see some foundations there. Well, we can be benefited by turning on the Google Earth community who's taken painstaking hours to research all this information here. And look what we have. Doomtown. The town too tough to die. The original effects test area. And the close cousin to Survival Town 1 and 2. The town in the third Indiana Jones movie. You know what they did in the Indiana Jones movie, right? They were... Indiana got inside of a refrigerator to protect himself from a nuclear blast, which is not wise. And children don't get into refrigerators ever. But here we are, U.S. nuke, Operation Encore, May 8, 1953, 27 kilotons, Operation Rise Line, Doom Down. All of these underground nuclear test sites here. Every crater is a different underground nuclear test. And... We can just get the information on any one of these. Well, I, I should be able to. Hold on. Why is that not coming up? Well, that's crazy. Well, my information is not coming up on the underground nuke test site right now. We're getting everything else on it, but not... Oh, okay. I guess that was just one that's missing. U.S. Nuke Operation Tijeras, October 14, 1970, 89 kilotons, for instance. The whole valley is made up of underground nuke test sites. Now wait, look at this. What the heck? A bunch of hot spots? When did these appear? Dude, today! November 7th. A bunch of hot spots in the desert around Las Vegas. What's out here? Hold on. What is this? Dude! High voltage power lines going through the middle of the desert. Wow. Look, there's nothing here to burn. Quite literally, it's sparse sagebrush at the most, like not even enough that could burn point to point. There's nothing here to burn. There is nothing here to burn. This is quite literally desert. I mean, there are sagebrush. Don't get me wrong. I mean, there is some sagebrush, but what is this? High Desert State Prison. Whoa. Dude. 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 All right. Power lines here again. Desert location. Major power line here. Coming out off the road, going up and around, following this path. Let's go in and zoom in on it and see it. All right. It's grainy imagery. That's not going to help much. Is this a road or is this power line? That looks like a road. That's road. All around Vegas. Look at that, man. Look at that. That's that's in the last 24 hours. Up into the mountains and everything. What's this? More high voltage power lines. Big time. Right next to them. Going right across. All the way up to the north. This whole thing. That's where these are. That's what these are. These are the high voltage power lines. You can see the little pads for each station. And it cuts over and it goes over and the, the hot spots cut over and go over. <laughs> now, again, it's detecting it on all sides of the power lines out by a few miles. What, what about this? Is this another set? Sure is. Look at that. Dang, that's huge. That's the power coming in from the north. Again, to feed the power into Las Vegas or out of Las Vegas. Even down here on the side of Hoover Dam. Again, major electrical power generation here at Hoover Dam. Isn't that isn't this Hoover Dam? Pretty sure it is. Yeah, there it is. Hoover Dam. Amazing stuff going on here, guys. Look at that. So, nuke test site getting hit. Hot spots appearing all the way around Vegas going up to Hoover Dam. As of last night, going into this morning. And the hotspots, again, electrical. Electrical, guys. I, again, I, I'm, I'm leaning towards it. Some kind of shorting out piezoelectric discharge into the crust. Detected as a heat signature. Look, they go all the way across Nevada. Which is rare. We haven't seen hotspots across Nevada in 
God knows. Look, and look, we're going in right next to another series of high voltage. Oh, and a Corey. Oh, wow. Corey and high voltage power lines going into the Corey. No duh. Of course, they're going to provide power to that. Let's go up to the north and see. Yep. We're following the power lines to the north. Stopping around central Nevada. What about this? Yep. Wow. Amazing. So, yeah, our power lines are shorting out, maybe? Maybe it's not shorting. Maybe it's just heating along it that the satellite's detecting. But the hotspots are showing up. There's no doubt about that. And there's nothing there to burn. So you can't tell me it's farmers burning their fields when you're in the mountainous regions of Nevada. <laughs> Mountainous regions of Rocky, Nevada, with not a farm in sight for a hundred miles. Let's go down to the east by southeast. Let's trail this off down at the far south tip of all these earthquakes. Ocotillo, Ocotillo, California. Ocotillo, Ocotillo. I'm from Missouri. Do not try to correct me on my pronunciation. Not only that, I'm not going to read the comments like weeks later, so don't worry about it. Here we are. We're right next to Salton Sea. And wait, hold on. We have a hotspot detected there. As of yesterday, last night. Look where we are. Real great place to put your farm field burning. You know, I guess a farmer takes his stuff out here and hides it underneath. Puts it in this little valley right here and sets it on fire so he can burn it all in secret. Wait, that's on state land. That's at the Anza Borrego Desert State Wildlife Wilderness. And it's desert. Come on. So we've got another set of hotspots right here next to a, another volcano, which is right here. The Sultan Buttes. And to top it all off, they've drilled it to get steam to turn these electrical generating turbines to provide power for the area. And the high voltage power lines go out from here and go down to San Diego. And our electrical generating stations go all the way down here to the border where they've added in a few solar farms on one side and geothermal on the other. You cannot tell me that the, oh look, look, there's another hotspot. When was this from? Last night. Look, look what's there. The Look what's there. Sand dunes, guy. Sand dunes are there. That's it. There's nothing else there except for the San Andreas Fault and volcanoes and power generation station down to the southwest. Picked up by satellite, so it's not like it's a campfire. What could cause a hotspot to come up off the San Andreas or right next to it in the desert? The same thing that could cause all this other activity. Seismic. Seismic activity spreading out across the plate, finding the weak points, which then breaks with a small earthquake as the plate starts shifting. And the craton shifting all the way over to Missouri, where we have our power lines getting hit with earthquakes, which is so weird. And I can't believe I didn't figure that out till this year. That's the craziest part. Thank you, Tattooed, for getting that ball rolling. And let's go back and turn back on our seven-day feed of 0.0, .0 and greater quakes. Here we are. And we'll hit refresh, make sure and see if anything else has hit. Because we didn't even talk internationally about, like, Europe, for instance. We could quickly cover Europe and cover Asia. The fives that I talked about at the start of this update... The equal spread of the same-sized earthquakes going up to Japan took place going all the way over to Europe last week. And we saw big activity, the biggest earthquake in years in Europe this past week. Down in Greece and Turkey, major damage, tsunami generated. Since then, we saw a new 5.0 earthquake, which, well, 4.9 from the USGS, strike right up here on the back end of our arrow. Going up into Bulgaria and North Greece. This is Bulgaria. This is North Greece. This is Romania further to the north. 
and Romania was struck by a 4.0 earthquake already this past week. As well as mid-range four, maybe even bigger, striking at the Croatia-Bosnia border. So, 5.0 creeping to the north, out of the Aegean Sea. 5.0 range activity going north up next to Croatia and Bosnia. The only spots left to move that I was looking for to see activity, and we still have a few more days to go, would be over here in Romania and over here in Italy. So far, we're right next to Italy, but Italy hasn't been hit yet. Then secondarily, we have not seen the activity up here on the English Channel yet going into the UK. We're like five days in on this. So I would expect, or six days in, we are six days in on this. Which means we have one to two more days to go. We're watching for one to two more days for this activity to spread over to Italy, over to Romania, and up to the English Channel. So far, Croatia and Romania, eh, I would expect something bigger to come rolling in, guys. Two days from now, I will cancel the warning if I need to. Anything else going on? I think that's it. Central and South America swarming out with our fives and our sixes over the past few days. Central America, you can really see it. This line of quakes that goes out of Mexico goes down across Central America over to the east, all the way over to the Eastern Caribbean. Just look at our fours and greater. There we go. So, do you see the whitish colored earthquakes and the pinkish? Pinkish struck two days ago. Whitish struck in the last day. And in between the two, of course, we have a few. And going over to the USGS map, look down in South America. Let me turn off that. Here we are. Going over to the east, it's again pretty obvious. The earthquakes are going right down to the south and over to the east, over to the Eastern Caribbean. It's bypassing Jamaica, bypassing Cuba, bypassing the Cayman Islands, and going straight over to the east. So far, so far, it's coming out of South America, going down around, and over to the east. I would expect this area to be filled in. Wasn't filled in this past week. Should be filled in. By something larger than what's on both sides, which means 5.0 range activity coming in in the next few days. Central point between these sets of quakes on the plate boundary. That puts us west of Jamaica next to Cayman again. So Cayman Island, get ready. 5.0 range coming in right out in the ocean. Hey, hold on, look at this. A new deep earthquake struck right down below the catcher's mid position in the Bay of Plenty of New Zealand. A deep earthquake, 4.2, down at 266 kilometers deep. This means we need to watch for something up to one magnitude larger to strike in New Zealand or very close to it in the next couple days. I would say up to seven days, but... Usually the turnaround down here is not too long. The plate boundary goes down across New Zealand. Do you see where our rings overlap? I would warn between Christchurch and this earthquake, which puts us at Wellington, Kaikoura. And Christchurch was already hit by a four, which is somewhat rare. We don't see that much activity down in Christchurch. It's usually to your north by 50 to 100 miles. But where the rings overlap. So let's put it down for a five to come rolling in on the North Island of New Zealand in the next few days. Anything... Oh, and by the way, 5.2 is the highest I think we would go, but knock on wood. Hope I'm wrong on it. Hope nothing hits at all. Is there anything else that's happened since I started my update? You know, again, we got to go back and check because sometimes in an hour's time can make all the difference in the world. I don't see anything else. Good. Oh, my Hawaiian viewers. Aloha, guys. Hawaii. Look in the past several days what's gone on across the South Island, or the south part of the big island. Pretty much halfway across the island and everywhere south. All the same sized earthquakes with the biggest of the bunch going up to 3.0. And where's the 3.0 range activity or 2.9? Striking the Middle East Rift Zone. Right along the coast, south of Pu'u'o'o. East, southeast, oh, sorry about that. East by southeast of Kilauea. That's where the biggest activity is going on, on land. Out in the ocean, it's also 3.0 range, but it's down here at Lo'ihi. Lo'ihi is a volcano that's under sea out in the ocean, south of the big island. Let me show it to you. So the Middle East Rift Zone and half the big island. Wait a second. Half the big island, everywhere from here 
south. With one quake up here next to Hualalai. Or no, no, I'm sorry. Up here on the northeast side next to Mauna Kea. But the rest, halfway across the island, or just under half. And south, come on. Goes from Mauna Loa down to Kilauea down to Loihi. With the biggest bunch being right in the middle. Right along the coast. So the Middle East Rift Zone, I think, is reaching its pinnacle. I think it's reaching its highest point so far since the drain out has happened. Look at the spacing on this. Another way to look at this. The spacing going across the big island. 1.8, 2.8, 2.6, 3.2. Let me turn down the ring so you can see this a little better. Wait for it to refresh. Past few days. Do you see this? So at least on the western edge of this, it's virtually equal spaced all the way across from the coast to coast on the big island. Now what could cause that? Well, I would propose that the same thing that could cause the equal spacing of all these quakes going over on the western side, it points back to a pinnacle to a spot. <laughs> Let's go look. Let's go back to, it's like a triangle pointing back to a pinnacle. But think of this three-dimensionally now. This is, you got to have a 3D imagination. <laughs> So you're really looking down into this and across it. So that triangle shape is really, I think, going back down into something or back up into something is a better description. Look, here's the earthquake epicenter. Look where we're going, guys. Dude, we are right at the top of Pu'u'o'o. At the east of the Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. Oh, this is the Middle East Rift Zone, guys. Now, Kilauea is right here up at the top. I need to bring this at an angle. Again, you got to imagine this 3D, but in this case, you don't have to imagine much. I can show it to you. There. Now we're looking at a side profile of the big island. Here's Kilauea up here. It drained out and down last year. Over to the east, a little bit further down the slope from Kilauea, that's Bu'u'u'u'u. And this is the Middle East Rift Zone. Kilauea is at the top of the Middle East Rift Zone. But this is the actual magma chamber down below going down god how I, god knows how far it goes down way far down below here so this all collapsed drained out over on the side and now look where we are it all points back up to the middle of the middle east red zone and we're equally spaced out across the western side where i think all of this is charging it's just my take on it. I don't know if the professionals would agree with that or not, but come on, the biggest stack is in the middle of it all. So it all points back up to Pu'u'u'u'u, but look where the biggest stack is. Direct dead center in the middle of that triangle shape. Again, the center. And that's where we are. That's where all the earthquakes are, down here, next to Loihi. So if there's going to be a breakout, it's going to be between... Kilauea, Loihi, and Mauna Loa, I think. And what's between the three? The Middle East Rift Zone. That's why the earthquakes are striking there. I think. I could be wrong. Now, I was wrong on my estimation of time for eruption. But then again, so are the professionals. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I, I will reassess it if we get down the road in a little bit and it starts looking like it's going to do something. I will jump back on at a moment's notice and talk about it at length. This takes me in to something that I talk about in almost every update, which is I tell my viewers and everybody who listens, you need to have an earthquake plan. You need to know what to do when an earthquake strikes. So it's pretty basic. You take shelter. <laughs> you get underneath a table or a desk or you go outside. If you're going outside, you might not be coming back in for a fair amount of time. So you need a seasonal specific emergency kit that you can grab and take with you at a moment's notice, that covers a few of the bare minimums. So, change of clothes, set of shoes, or a way to keep yourself warm, or to shield yourself from extreme heat. Also, food and water for a couple days, as well as identification, you know, your ID, uh, insurance information, special documents, also medicine, first aid, sanitation, flashlight, batteries. The list goes on, but you will think of good things to put into your emergency kit. Make sure that you can get it onto your back and that other people in your household can also move it or carry it if necessary. And you will be way better off. And I mean way better off than all the people who just refuse to prepare. 
and for the people who had to evacuate in fires, for instance, when you're only given a couple minutes to get out of your house. If you've got all the stuff out of the way, like an extra set of car keys, an extra ID, you don't have to fumble to try to find your wallet or your purse. And then that valuable one to two minutes of getting out of your house time, you can then grab things that matter to you because you already have the backpack that has your ID, an extra set of keys, and all that stuff in it. Right? Okay. You guys, be safe. Much love. And I will be back if anything else goes down. We will save this as a video and put it out over on YouTube for everybody to watch back at a moment's notice. And we are pretty much in the last day of our warnings that expire basically tonight, Saturday going into Sunday. I mean, we could give it till tomorrow. Sunday is when we expire on most of these in the warned areas from my previous video from seven days ago. So you could say it expires tonight or it expires tomorrow if you want to go the full seven days international time. I will issue a new forecast tomorrow or, or Monday after all this expires. So we're waiting for Italy. We're waiting for Romania. We're waiting for the UK. Two of the five areas have been hit. <laughs> uh, and then on the West Coast, the slow slip carries on. And as the slow slip carries on, we carry on watching until the slow slip stops. And when the slow slip stops, or somewhere towards the end of it, we look for a big earthquake to release on the West Coast of the United States, in the Pacific Northwest, out in the ocean, most likely, off the coast of Washington, most likely. That's what we look for. But it's not taking place yet. Instead, we're waiting. Waiting for the slow slip to carry on or stop. That's why we watch the little red dots on the map all the time. That's why it's important for them to report it. I'll be back, guys. Much love. Peace out. Have a good weekend. Don't get too caught up in all the political BS, guys. You got to remember, you're the football, and the game is them. They're, they're the players, and you're the football. Just remember that, and it'll put a proper perspective on things. And remember, nothing ever changes. <laughs> Since the time of the Romans, nothing has ever changed. Ah, uh, we got some mud flutters who are going to disagree with me on that, aren't they? They're going to be like, Dutch, time of the Romans, what are you talking about? Hashtag Tartaria. Signing off. Peace out. Much love. People in chat are reporting a earthquake, 6.0 plus, possibly in the Fiji area, and it just hasn't popped on the feeds yet. So I'll put this in the recording too. This is Fiji area, so if we see a new 6 pop off, we've got a 5.9 from earlier, so I wouldn't be surprised if a new earthquake struck of 6 or greater there. But if it does, all that does is prove that we got the same sized earthquakes going from Japan down to Fiji down across the Pacific, down to Antarctica. Half the planet, 6.2 or greater. That's all it proves. But thank you, thank you, thank you for telling me about it. If it pops on here while I'm talking, of course, we'll see it. But otherwise, you'll see it pop on the feeds in just a little bit. Now we are signing off. Peace out.